Um, I'm Keith Grossman. I'm the president of Time. I am honored uh, to be to share this, I guess, screen with uh, somebody who I hold in the deepest regards, um, former mayor of Stockton, California, Michael Tubbs. Michael, how are you? I am so good. I wish we were in person, but happy to do this virtually and a big fan of Operation Hope and a big fan of time and even a bigger fan of Keith. So good to see you, brother. Well, so this might be like a mutual love fest <laughs> going on, you know, like um, I, 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 I got to ask you, like right off the bat, you know, you were you were in the public life for so long. You're in private life right now, public or private life. Which one are you liking more or, or which one did you like more? Well, my private life is now public life because I did public life before private life. So I just don't know. <laughs> the difference is I don't have to go to council meetings to get yelled at for three minutes during public comment. Um, other than that, everywhere I go, I was just in <laughs> I was just in news articles last week for an art gallery I went to just randomly at the last minute. It's just, but I think that's part of sort of the, having the responsibility to public trust and folks being interested in what you're doing. So it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, so like for people, people who don't know that are at this stage, I, I mean, one of the things that I held in the highest regards about you was you were you grew up in Stockton, right? You came back to Stockton and you actually were a public servant to the city that you grew up in and actually made some real change. Um, everyone loves to say they love change, right? But then when you try to actually implement change, like every obstacle falls in its way, like how do you, like if the theme of this conference is meet the moment, like how did you meet the moment and actually enact change? Or like, what was the first bit of change that you did where you went home and you said to your wife, wow, like I actually impacted this city for the good. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I want to start with this notion of, of change because I think sort of, we think of change in the abstract, but if you're going to be a change maker, you have to know you're, you're saying conflict. You're not saying change means conflict. It means fighting against the status quo. And one of the biggest learnings from the last eight years in local government is that no matter how failing a status quo is, people still cling on to that. There's still a, it's a status quo because there's some vested interest. There's some people who enjoy complaining about it or, or also benefit from it. Um, and I remember the first change I made when I was a councilman was there's this like intersection in my district that had a liquor store that was a problem um, in an empty lot. And over the span of two years, we shut down that problem liquor store and put a Dollar General there, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was the hugest deal because the city had tried to shut that liquor store down for 20 years, but couldn't. And then across the street, we put a credit union, a bank, which sounds like not a big deal, but it was a huge deal because for a three mile radius, there was no bank. And so many folks in that community were, were under bank or were going to check cashing places. And then across the street, we put a health clinic that operated 40 hours a week, which was huge because again, for so many folks in that community, particularly those who are undocumented, they didn't have a health home. It's particularly because one third of folks in that part of the district didn't have a car. Um, so what we what 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 I took from that was wow, being here matters. That what I'm doing matters. That that it, it, it matters who's in the seat. It matters who's in the room. And I think the last thing I'll say is in terms of making change and meeting the moment, is being focused on the moment. Because if you're focused on the next moment or your reelection or your promotion, you may not be responsive to what's needed in the moment. Because sometimes, particularly in times like this, where things are a little bit crazy, it's a time of, of drastic change, a time where lots of drastic changes are needed. Part of it is going to be sacrificial. Part of the leader is going to have to be doing things that might make you unpopular, doing things that might lead to you not being reelected doing things that may not lead to sort of what you see as success, but actually in the long haul is good and necessary to be responsive. Why, like, first of all, thank you. Like, why, why do you think, like I looked at some of the change that you implemented in Stockton and, and in full disclosure, right? Like we knew each other before this interview, we've known each other for probably a good year or so now. 
and like I watched a lot of the change that you implemented and um, like UBI, for instance, and, and that. Like, why do you think that was met with such sort of like visceral reactions when like all the data was showing that it was actually benefiting? Yeah, well, the community. I think there's really a, a couple things. Um, number one, I, I truly believe that we have these deeply held schemas or ideas about how our country works. And when those things are challenged, people take it as a personal offense. So when you say things like people are working but still can't eat, or people may need financial literacy, but more than that, they probably need money to manage. They probably need money to manage as a first step. And then we can decide how much money management training they need. Um, or you really push against these ideas, right? And I think particularly in this country, and we've seen it with the George Floyd protest, we've seen it over the past several years, but we're still in 2020. We just had a white supremacist insurrection on January 6th of this year, right? Like, like so we're, we're really fighting against these ideologies and underpinnings around work, around deservingness, around trust, around dignity, that really contends with some of the nastiest parts of our history. So I think that's part of it. It's not even about the data. It's about the story we tell ourselves about how the status quo came to be. And for some folks, and for so long, the national narrative has been people are poor because they don't work hard, which historically isn't true when the hardest working people in this country were not paid anything for 300 years, right? Or, 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 or the fact that people are poor because they make choices. When we have a whole economy set up that keeps people poor, where social mobility in this country is less than social mobility anywhere else in the developed world. And I think when we talk about things like a basic income, an economic floor, it really forces us to confront sort of our demons and also forces us to stretch towards our better angels. Like, do we really think that all people are created equal? Do I really think you'll spend money like I spend money? Do I really think that you don't deserve to go hungry, that you don't deserve to be poor? Um, so I think that's part of the tension. You know, it's, it's very funny. I was saying to someone, and, and part of the reason I think I was just drawn to you when, when our worlds sort of came together was when I was in college, I was a government major, right? And, uh, and I focused on American history and politics and theory. And I always came back to this view of UBI as if it's ever a real discussion, there's something wrong with the system, right? Because like there's something inherently wrong if with like the way that everything is structured, if like we have to force UBI into the debate or like into a policy. And, um, you know, like I, I sit on the board of New York Cares, which is New York City's largest volunteer network. And um, I chair what's called Stand With Students. And it's really to help Title I schools in New York City where um, this is the schools that have the most needs or the most sort of deficits or the most needy children um, uh, and to provide them with as many resources as possible. Like, is this, when you were mayor, did you see that you could make change? When you said, like, I'll focus in on the moment, did you see that you could make change in, in people's lives immediately? Or did you, did you also look at like, okay, like, how do I start to put into place generational change? Because you did something really interesting with the school system with giving people money if they, if they got to 12th grade, right? Like what was, what was the whole program that you put into place with the scholarships? Yeah, we Will you tell everyone about that? And, and like, yeah, no, thank you for that. We had a program called Stockton Scholars where Someone gave my good friend of mine, Evan Spiegel, gave me $20 million and said, hey, do something with this for the school system. And I, we thought about it and we said the best thing we can do is create a carrot to get the school district to do what's necessary to prepare, prepare our kids for after high school. So we created a program called Stockton Scholars where every single student who graduates from our largest school district, if they graduate just with a 2.0, and they apply to community college, they get if they go to community college, they get five hundred dollars. Because it's important to us because we realize that a disproportionate number of those kids going to community college are going to be stocked in residents. And we need to make sure they're educated and have all the support because they're going to be our future tax base. We said for kids going to a four-year school, you get a thousand dollars a year for four years. 
knowing that many of them may go off, but some of them will come back and some of them will have warm feelings towards the city and feel a sense of like, I owe my city something because my city gave me money just because I graduated and got into college. And then for kids who didn't go to college, community college, or we say, if you go to trade school, $500 a year for two years to go to trade school with the argument being, we believe in you. We're not just going to tell, because far too often, we tell people, to do, especially young people, to do this, do this, do this, but it's no guarantee. So it's like, why am I going to work so hard? Why am I not going to take extra shifts at Starbucks? Why am I not going to take extra shifts at McDonald's when there's no guarantee I'm doing anything after high school anyway, or I'll be able to afford it? So it's really late. What is the culture of expectation? But to the point of your question, a lot of it was focused on sort of the next generation, like 10 years, 20 years from now, how do we create feelings and investments into um, the future of our city in a way that they love the city, they have warm feelings for the city. And we also have feedback loops. We have a place for them to come back. They're coming back because they're part of the Stockton Scholars. They, they, they have that sort of branding, that identity. And then even with basic income, the idea was to meet the immediate needs of a small amount of people, but to start a national conversation so we could get to scale. And I think one of the frustrations that I ran into with the political system was that so much of it was not just performative, but so immediate. And I'm like, we have to do the immediate things, but that's necessary, but not sufficient. That's really meet the moment. We have to think about what the next 50 years of the city will look like. I think those longer term bets in terms of, child, we also started childhood savings accounts my last year as mayor to make sure that kindergarten started with $500. So by the time they graduated, they can match it with their Stockton scholarship and have $4,000 for college, right? And I think that long view for a lot of people felt a little bit different, a little bit scary. I think for older people, a little bit jealous. Like, well, I'm 50, I'm 60, I don't have kids. My kids are gonna benefit. Like, what about me, what about mine? Um, but I think sort of the only way we really beat this moment is to think about the next 50 years, the next 40 years, the next 60 years. And the last thing I'll say is I think to, to, to meet the moment and to think long-term I mean, I, I, I don't know anything about NFTs, Keith, but I have admired how time has embraced it. And time is saying, look, this is going to be part in some way of the future media. Let's be early adopters. Let's iterate. Let's try. And I think that's the level of leadership and innovation that's so important because the future is coming. And we have ownership of it based on what we do today, but we have to be thinking about it. We can't be thinking about what is is always going to be what is. Everything new is scary and won't happen because it always ends up actually happening. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's it's so crazy. Like, I always find that when I ask people if they like change, everyone's like, "Oh, I love change," right? And then you're like, "Okay, we're going to change." Everyone's like, "No, no, 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 we won't change," right? And it's and and it makes the long term planning sometimes harder. Sometimes um, we take on an approach that our owner, Mark Benioff says, which is a uh, tactics dictate strategy over time, right? And with the North Star as to where we want to ultimately get to. You said something that was super interesting to me about, um, uh, you know, investing in the citizens of Stockton so that way they come back, right? And you came out, you have this book. So I, I deliberately am going to embarrass him, okay? This is this is Michael Tubbs's new book. It's coming out on November sixteenth, right? Is it November sixteenth? When is it? When does it come November out? November sixteenth. Okay. Okay. Perfect. But like, and it's it's a memoir of hope and home, but but the title is the deeper the roots, and um, I've heard you talk about this expression, the deeper the roots, infinite times, and I like. I, before we get into the book and like why you were brought back to Stockton, will you just talk about this expression and its meaning to you and like how you've used it to motivate yourself and others throughout your career? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the deeper the roots, I wish I was smart enough to come up with the phrase, but it actually comes from one of my favorite Tupac songs, um, Keep Your Head Up, when he says, they say that Darker, no, the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. I say the darker, darker the flesh, the deeper the roots. And when I think of the deeper the roots, I think it speaks to sort of being really grounded and, and planted in a place and feeling things so viscerally or being so centered that you're able to grow. Like having your foundation laid in such a way that for good or bad, it's the foundation, but it's very clear what it is and you're so centered that then growth and iteration and launching can happen. 
Um, and that's why we thought that would be a good title for the book, because it's really about sort of how my roots are deeply rooted in the place called Stockton, California. And my mom, my aunt and grandmother who raised me and how those experiences were formative and sort of helped build the foundation I'm building on today and how the basic income stuff, the Stockton Scholar stuff, all the things are based off that, the, the, the deep roots that, that my family instilled in me. Um, and yeah, writing a book is very hard. I don't know how people write more than one. Um, I'm excited for it to be out in the world because I think it speaks to sort of the themes of this conversation, but also talks about sort of, um, I think it's, it's, it's a current book. So it talks about current themes, leadership, racism, love, family. And then also I lost, so I wrote the book in October and it was done and I lost in November. So I had to spend the rest of the year writing another two chapters about losing and how you rebound from that and how you think about that. And I think for me, What's, it sucked then, but I think what's beautiful now is that for everyone, home is a really contested notion, that home isn't all butterflies and victories, that home could be painful. Home could be a, I mean, you think about your wins, but you think about some of your losses. And I think that's what makes me excited about sharing the book with the world. I, I will say this in, in, in full disclosure, I watched your race and when you lost, A, my jaw hit the ground, B, I think I used 25 expletives, uh, uh, which I will not use, John, here now uh, on stage. We'll keep this uh, like totally rated G of a conversation. But, um, you know, like part of the reason I was so upset was because I thought you were making real change and you were making long term change in a world that has short term thinking. Um, I guess like I would I'd love like two questions about the book specifically. Um, uh, like, what would you say um, uh, the most important lesson learned from the loss was for you? Yeah, I think the most important lesson learned from the loss for me is that purpose and position aren't the same things. And that whatever your position is, it's not the end, but it's a means to an end and purpose. Meaning that whatever title you hold, whatever, whatever all, all that, isn't the end goal. The end goal is the verb. Like, what do you want to do? And what are you going to do? And I think that's super important because titles can be taken away. Um, jobs can be taken away. Um, you can win or lose elections, but your purpose is your purpose. So regardless of what your title is, as long as you're clear about what your work, what your, like what your work is, you'll always have that clarity to, to do what, to do what you're, you're here to do. And I didn't really understand that until I lost. And I was like, well, I can still do guaranteed income stuff, even though I'm not the mayor. I can still talk about dignity and justice for all people, even though I'm not the mayor. I can still challenge harmful tropes and stereotypes and really focus on increasing opportunity, even though I'm not the mayor. Like the mayor was just a tool. At that time, I used to do these things and I have to find other tools, but to still do the same things. I, I, I'm just going to pause for a second because it's, it's like, I mean, what you just said is so amazing and so so poignant. Um, what was what was in this? What was the hardest, most vulnerable part of the book to write? Well, it's funny. So I had a first draft before my first child was born, but it was so sanitized. It was so more looking forward than looking back. So it was more about okay, I don't want to say something that might derail future political moves. Blah blah blah. But then when my son was born, I said, you know what? I want to be really honest and frank. So I think I'm not I, I'm not a vulnerable person, honestly, most times. But so that's what made the book really difficult. So I talk more about my father in this book than I've ever talked about him. I've actually thought about my father more in writing this book than I've ever thought about him. So talking about those feelings and having to go back to being a nine-year-old kid wondering where your dad is and like kind of those feelings I had suppressed, that was difficult. I don't talk often about the time I got a DUI when I was a council member, um, but I talk about it in great detail in the, in the book and sort of some people are like, you shouldn't do that. It's going to be moralized forever. But I think there's so many lessons and it's so much part of the story and so much part of the person I'm becoming. So I'll talk about that and feeling just embarrassed in the council meeting after that and how that felt and sort of, um, so I think those two things were kind of hard because the things I, don't talk about or even if I talk about them, I don't think about them or feel them. 
starting to go back and revisit those feelings was actually therapeutic, but it was a little bit scary because like tell, showing the world like this is like a pain point or this is a time where I really messed up where every critique, every criticism was worth it, where I blew it. Um, and, and, and I had a, I was a councilman and, 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 and yeah, and I usually, yeah. So, so I don't know if everyone in the audience knows this, but your wife is also an incredible writer and she just came out with a book, right? And do you want to give her book a plug yeah. for a second so that way everyone can know what the book so is? My wife, book a plug? Um, she wrote a book called The Three Mothers about the mothers of Dr. King, Malcolm X, and James Baldwin. And it's basically a, 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 a argument and historical analysis that illustrates how we can't really make sense of who these men were, their talents, their strengths, their life, without considering who their mothers were. It also begs the question, why did we weren't taught history this way from the beginning? Like, why is this new knowledge? Like, why do we not know that their moms were actually activists, leaders, like everything they did, you could trace directly in many respects to their mothers. Um, so it talks about that, but I think implicitly it talks about the erasure of women, the erasure of black women, and how thinking through sort of those experiences could actually lead to better outcomes, better policy. So, so you did such a great, beautiful job of, of presenting her book that I now feel bad with my joke of, do you talk about whose book is going to be a better bestseller? Well, I think it's different. <laughs> my wife spent more time sort of, her book was her dissertation. Her book's not about herself. So I think sort of the, the level of work and skill is different. And I think because I just have a larger public profile yeah. and I also had the advantage of learning from her book campaign, and what worked, what didn't work. I, she'll probably win more awards but in college, it was like that. She would win Phi Beta Kappa Research Award. Blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> my book might sell a little bit more. <laughs> Ooh, wow. I have, I have, I have, like, I have a, a press plan. I have a PR, because I learned from her book. So I'm like, okay, we need to do this, we need to not do that. Uh, I, I mean, I can't wait to read your book. I literally got it two days ago. And as you mentioned, like we, we launched uh, entire Web3 NFT community with time. And so like I've not slept in, in a few days, but like I will get through your book by the end of this weekend. If not, I found that I learned so much from your wife's book. Like I, I it, it was so educational on, on every level. Um, John Hope Ryan, I want to turn the conversation with the last few minutes to him. And I and I know that he's sitting there in the audience right now and he's probably smiling and he probably just went like this because he just doesn't want us to talk about him at all. But first I need to ask you a question. Like when you meet him and you like talk to him, isn't he, he's just like one of the most inspirational people you've ever met, right? Like like I walk away from him every time like like wanting to run down the street and do something good and change. I don't know if you feel that way about him. I, I think for me, I've always been drawn to this notion that sort of opportunity is good and access to capital is great. Yeah. And I love the fact that he's found a way to operationalize and make that will, real. So I think it's very, uh, it's a model to follow. And, and I'm just a big fan of the work and the way he's leveraged his relationships and all the folks he knows with influence and power to focus on this issue. You know, he said to me once that um, there's some people who are candles that light other candles, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I, 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 I see you as a candle. I see you as Michael Tubbs, as a candle that lights other candles. And it's just, it's an amazing room that like, unfortunately, because of COVID, like, we're not able to travel and, and be in um, with you all, but like, what would the room when I saw the list of people in it is a room of candles. And so, what would you what would your advice to the room be? You know, like we're we're coming to a close of our conversation. I, I really appreciate your time and 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 you you joining me for this. But like, what would it, like if if we have a room of candles? And we don't want them to get too close together because they'll become a bonfire, right? So it's like a room of candles. 
What's your What's your advice to to this room? To meet the moment. No, I, it's funny because candles reminds me of um, when the Sunday school stories talk growing up about how sort of if you're a candle, you are the light of the world, and what good does light do if it's under a bushel, right? So I think the lesson for all the candles is to, if you're gonna be a candle, shine. But candles shine in dark places. There's no use for a candle in a room where the lights are on. There's no use for a candle when it's just a bunch of other, when you can see everything. Candles are much more necessary and much more powerful where it's dark, where there's no direction, where there's no vision, where there's no foresight, and I think sort of that's what we're all called to do in this moment is to be candles, but to be candles in dark places, to shine light on human dignity, to shine light on equality, to shine light on democracy, to shine light on opportunity, and to point the path forward and not just have folks being in the dark pointing at each other, butting heads, but flashing the light, but all to signal the way, like, this is how we go. This is where we should go. And I think that's the work we all have to do. And I think... Uh, Mr. Bryant is a great example of, of how to do that. And, and, and I think it's a challenge for all of us to, to do that and do it even if we can. I mean, it's going to be hard to emulate, much less do more, but we should at least strive to do more. Because at least we have his model. He had to make up the model. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like, I, I find him so incredible. The only thing that puzzles me about him is that crazy device he has behind him, that circular thing that's in his office. I don't know, like nobody knows what that thing is, but like he seems to always broadcast from in front of it. But I don't think that we could uh, end this conversation on a on a on a more incredibly prescient bit of advice from you. And you know, I just want to thank you for your time tonight and or today and. Uh, uh, and John, you know, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation at, at your events. You know, you mean the world to me personally. And as you can see, like every person you touch, you are a candle. And um, and I hope that that makes you proud. And, you know, thank you so much for the opportunity to to have this conversation tonight.